And now we're going to move on to how our health system should respond to issues around HIV and ageing. Um, and we're very fortunate to have uh, Wafa Al Sadr, who's the director of ICAP at Columbia University. She's professor of epidemiology and medicine at Columbia. She has an interest in the design, implementation, and scale up of programs globally, and has a research interest in implementation science, uh, epidemiological, and clinical research. Please welcome Wafa. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Rob, and thank you all for being here. Okay, I'm going to talk to you very briefly today about HIV and aging and particularly um, issues around shaping a relevant health systems response. So this is an outline of my presentation. I will briefly uh, describe some of the characteristics of older uh, people who are living with HIV, uh, then move on to some of, uh, of describing the data we have of age as a risk factor for, co for some of the comorbidities in uh, persons living with HIV. Then I'll touch on the health system challenges for older uh, persons living with HIV, and then finally end with, sh with shaping a health system's response for older individuals with HIV. So as you know, you've heard at this conference there's been enormous success over the past decade in scaling up of HIV treatment, and this of course has led to an increase in life expectancy for people living with HIV, uh, which has meant that uh, many more people living with HIV are living longer and therefore aging, uh, and therefore aging and joining the older age groups. Then we try to think about what do we know about people living with HIV. I think the reality is there's a paucity of information actually, particularly on uh, those who are living with HIV from low and middle income countries. We have very well developed cohorts from uh, developed countries, but uh, much less data from uh, those of developing countries and low and middle income countries. Uh, one source of data is a study that we call optimal model studies that ICAP is fortunate to be conducting in several countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And a unique feature of this study is that it collects data, routinely collected clinical data, uh, from people who are engaged in HIV care or on, on treatment. The study is being conducted in several countries. You can see here in sub-Saharan Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Mozambique, and Tanzania. And you can see that in the study there are about... Uh, Four and a half, uh, 459,000 individuals who are enrolled in the study and followed in clinical care, as well as about 50,000 children. So I'm going to show you some data from, this, uh, from these, this study to try to shed some light on what are the characteristics of older individuals with HIV uh, from sub-Saharan Africa. So on this figure, you'll see um, on the y-axis the percentage of adults who are um, 50 years of age or older, and on the x-axis are from 2005 to 2011. And as you can see here in the black line are the, is the proportion of individuals 50 years or older who are enrolling, newly enrolled in HIV care. And as you can see that over the years, it's remained, about, it's remained stable, about 10% or so of people engaged in care at the, in these settings are 50 years or older. You will see also from the other line here uh, that those who are actively in HIV care in the dotted uh, black line has been increasing. And this, of course, will tell you, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. It means that older individuals are being retained in care. What's interesting is you also note in the, black, in the red line here, these are the proportion of older individuals who are newly initiating ERT, and you see there's been a substantial increase over time, as well as those who are retained on uh, ERT, a substantial increase in the proportion over time. Another interesting observation is if you look at the, the proportion of women versus men, and we all know that the data uh, ubiquitously show, uh, consistently show that a uh, higher proportion of women are engaging in care and initiating antiretroviral therapy from sub-Saharan Africa. What's interesting, if you look at by age though, and here on the y-axis are percent male, and on the x-axis are different age groups. And if you look at the age group of 15 to 24 years of age, a very small proportion of, uh, of the enrollees are actually men. Um, about 15% newly enrolled in HIV care, and similar small proportion are also newly initiating ART in this age group. On the other hand, as we go to older age groups, 
you'll see that at the age in 50, in those 50 years of age or older, about half of those who are newly enrolling in HIV care or newly initiating ART are men. So what this tells us is that in the, if we target and try to reach the older population with HIV infection, we are going to be able to hopefully reach the men. And I know that that's been a challenge uh, for all programs, HIV programs, in trying to reach men in the community, identify those who are positive, and engage them in HIV care and treatment. Another interesting feature from these same data is to look at the CD4 cell count at enrollment in HIV care for older uh, persons who are living with HIV. And on the x-axis and the y-axis are the median CD4 cell count, and then on the y-axis are by the age, uh, by age strata. And you will see here that uh, if you look at the, the blue dots, this is the median CD4 at enrollment into HIV care. And you'll see that amongst older individuals, they are enrolling in HIV care at more advanced HIV uh, disease stage with lower CD4 cell count. CD4 at initiation of ART is similar, but that's often governed, obviously, by the ART guidelines within those countries. So that demonstrates to us that older individuals are engaging in, in HIV care at, at the more advanced stages of HIV disease. Now, what happens to those individuals after they enroll in care? And here are data also uh, from um, some of the data we have seen. These are data specifically from Rwanda which show that actually if you look over from enrollment till about 24 months and you look at the CD4 cell count, you will see that amongst, um, for older uh, individuals living with HIV with higher CD4 cell count, you'll see over time in the orange bars, these are the older individuals versus the younger individuals, that they're losing more CD4 cell counts during follow-up. This is during pre-ART -pre follow-up. Actually, it shows that amongst patients who are four years of age or older, they lost 10 or more CD4 cell counts per year compared to 15 to, um, four, uh, 15 to 40 years old. So it means that older individuals are enrolling with advanced stages of HIV disease and also are losing more uh, CD4 cell counts during pre-ART follow-up. Now, what happens after you initiate antiretroviral therapy in older individuals? And on these data, you'll see here, let's look first at all patients. And this looks at the CD4, the median CD4 cell count after initiation of antiretroviral therapy. In blue are the younger age groups, in orange are the older age groups, and you'll see that in all patients, older individuals have less robust CD4 response compared to younger individuals. And this, this can be noted both in men and in women. What happens then once older individuals are enrolled in HIV care or are initiated on antiretroviral therapy? And here we have good news to some extent. If you look at loss to follow-up overall uh, by age group, you'll see that amongst the older age group, this is uh, loss to follow-up um, uh, during, during HIV care, that they're less likely to be lost to follow-up, both those engaged in HIV care, as well as after initiation of antiretroviral therapy, so better retention in older individuals. Not surprisingly, if you look at the mortality, though, there's a higher mortality in the older age groups compared to the younger age groups in those in HIV care, as well as similarly those who are initiating, uh, who have initiated antiretroviral therapy. So let's move on to another uh, topic, uh, which is relevant, obviously, to the, to the session today, which is the age of persons living with HIV and risk of non-communicable disease. And here we really suffer from paucity of data uh, from low- and middle-income countries. Most of the data we have are from developed countries. And there's a real need to uh, do some data, to look at some of the incidents as well as prevalence in populations from, uh, certainly from Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. So most of the data that I'll show you, or all of the data actually, are from developed cohorts, and similar to what Peter Rice showed you earlier, this is from the DAD cohort that shows that age and risk of diabetes, again, that age, uh, every five years of age, there was an increase in the risk of development of, of the incidence of diabetes, substantial here, a significant risk associated with age. If we look at the risk of development of hypertension, similarly from the DAD cohort, very well characterized cohort, you'll see again that in the age group that's more than 45 years of age, the dotted line, there was an increased risk with, um, uh, over time uh, with, um, in older individuals, higher risk in older individuals with development of hypertension. 
And lastly, if you look at age and risk of myocardial infarction in persons living with HIV, also from the same DAD cohort, uh, you will see again that age, if you look here, this is one, this line, you'll see that age was associated, independently associated with the risk of myocardial infarction in persons living with HIV, um, as well as, of course, some of the other traditional risk factors like smoking, family history, male sex, et cetera. So the data that we have available to us indicate that there's a higher risk of these non-communicable diseases with age. But I have to remind again that most of our data are from developed countries and there is an urgent need to collect similar data on incidence of these conditions and the risk factors in developing countries. So what are the health system's challenges for older persons living with HIV? I think obviously we need to, uh, we, as I mentioned to you, we need to achieve earlier diagnosis of HIV. The data I showed you shows that they tend to get enrolled much later with HIV. We have to also have careful follow-up during the pre-ART period and after initiation of antiretroviral therapy because of the lower CD4 cell count and enrollment and because of the loss of CD4 uh, during pre-ART period that's uh, substantially more than in, not in the younger population and also because of the less robust response to antiretroviral therapy in terms of CD4 increase. Obviously, there needs to be screening for and management of risk factors for non-communicable diseases and for NCDs themselves. And continuity care models attentive to the characteristic of HIV disease and comorbid conditions are urgently needed. So let's look at some of the ideas and focus on what can be done. So this is just a listing of health system strategies, and I'll use that just as, as examples. So as we think of on this side here, what are the elements that we need to keep in mind as we're trying to address the challenges in older individuals? They pertain to diagnosis and enrollment, they pertain to retention adherence, to the need for a multidisciplinary approach, the monitoring, the linkage and referrals, the self-management issues, and community linkages and, and partnerships. I don't have time to obviously cover all of these, but I think as we look ahead and try to shape uh, an appropriate health systems response, we need to be thinking of the characteristics that I just shared with you and how we need to shape, shape the health system uh, in all of these domains. So in terms of diagnosis and enrollment in care, um, as, as was indicated before, often the patients themselves and the providers may be unaware of HIV risk in older individuals. And, uh, and that may be one of the impediments and that's why we have delayed diagnosis. The messaging itself, and that was uh, mentioned again, the messaging regarding HIV and the importance of HIV testing has largely been targeted at younger individuals and not older individuals. So they may not believe that they are included uh, in the population at risk. And also very importantly, the current testing venues that have been most successful uh, are really not suitable often for older individuals like antenatal care, which is for women in childbearing ages and are not elder friendly. So HIV testing needs to be tailored uh, for older individuals in settings where they're likely to be found, including uh, provider-initiated counseling and testing in inpatient settings, TB clinics is another important place, as well as uh, counseling and testing in chronic disease clinics if they exist, as well as in family-focused testing, but not thinking of the younger generations, but thinking more of the grandmother, the grandfather, the older uncle, et cetera, as we reach out to the families that are at risk for HIV. In terms of monitoring retention adherence, uh, retention, as I mentioned to you, in pre-ART and after ART initiation is critical for disease monitoring, particularly because of the characteristics that I showed you. We don't know what the frequency should be, actually, but uh, this may need to be uh, something that should be looked at, and we don't know whether it should be more frequent uh, monitoring than in younger individuals. Certainly, the monitoring for side effects of antiretroviral therapy is important even more so in older individuals where there's usually a compromise of renal function, for example, and because of the other medicines that are required for co-management of comorbidities. And adherence counseling is critical because of the polypharmacy issues uh, of people who, with HIV who also need medications for non-HIV conditions. An important foundation of retention and adherence in many settings has been the, the use of peer educators. However, we all know that peer educators tend to be young, and as we shape programs for older individuals, we need to also think about matching peers that are truly peers for the older populations. And again, family-focused care is appropriate for older individuals, but need to be redirected, refocused 
rather than the focus currently on younger families. And then, of course, innovative methods are needed to screen and manage uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, mental illness among older uh, persons living with HIV. I think it's helpful to think of, as we shape a health system's response, to think of the continuum of care. And this is relevant for older individuals as it is relevant for any individual living with HIV. And again, if we think at the bottom here of the characteristics as I described them to you of older persons living with HIV, HIV testing needs to be targeted to specific settings to, have, to achieve earlier diagnosis. There needs to be in the pre-ART phase much more careful monitoring for disease progression, again, because of the characteristics of the population. And then once ART is initiated, monitor the response to ART most, more closely because of the less robust CD4 response, as well as, of course, monitor for adherence and, bar, and viral suppression retention, if, viral suppression, if possible, retention, certainly, <coughs> and monitor, of course, for side effects of multiple medications. And across this whole continuum, it's really critical that we use this continuum, use this platform to screen and manage non-communicable disease risk, risk factors as well as the conditions themselves at every uh, component of the continuum. So what are some models of, uh, of, some models of care that can be considered that take into account HIV and NCD? And the reality is we've had very little, um, very little experimentation, very little work that's been done to look at what's the most appropriate model. Is it that there should be uh, parallel systems where HIV diseases and non-communicable diseases uh, are co-occur co in a setting and there's some communication between the two? Or is it better to have a, coordin a coordination of services with some overlap, whether it be with providers or services? And lastly, of course, the last uh, model is an integrated service model, which is a chronic disease services model where everything happens together. We do not know which is better and there's a need, obviously, to, to test and demonstrate which of these is more advantageous uh, for the population of interest. I want to end with just uh, touching a bit on the opportunities for implementation research, which is very critical. Yesterday, Paolo Miotti presented a very uh, a, a terrific list of all the research questions that remain unanswered as we're thinking of non-communicable disease. But I'll focus just on some of the implementation science uh, questions. There certainly is a missed opportunity for screening. Uh, persons living with HIV enrolled in care are rarely screened for cardiovascular disease or diabetes or other non-communicable disease risk factors, despite their frequent contact with the health system. It also is a missed opportunity for management. And again, chronic care systems that develop for HIV can theoretically also be leveraged to manage other chronic diseases as well or other risk factors for chronic disease. And we have not done this, and I think there's great urgency to really do the implementation research so we can leverage uh, this potential to really tackle the conditions and that are predominant in older persons living with HIV. Now, ICAP is currently conducting some small studies that are trying to, um, to answer some of these questions. Uh, one of the studies is called the HEART study in South Africa, and it's looking at the feasibility of integrating a cardiovascular disease risk factor screening and risk stratification for persons living with HIV who are on antiretroviral therapy to be conducted by nurses uh, within the HIV clinics. And another study we're conducting, in, we're about to start, in, is a Link for Health cardiovascular disease study in Swaziland. And this is a study that um, has two phases. In phase one, we're examining the feasibility, acceptability, the cost and time for cardiovascular uh, disease risk, uh, risk factor screening again, conducted by nurses. And then in phase two, participants with such risk factors will be randomized to management in the HIV clinic versus management in the outpatient clinic. And the outcome of interest is the combined linkage to cardiovascular risk factor management and retention for both HIV and cardiovascular disease care. And lastly, also we're conducting an ongoing study in Kenya, or Arctic study, and this study is aiming to um, look at the prevalence of non-communicable disease risk factors and non-communicable disease in a cohort of HIV-infected individuals who are ART-naive and initiating antiretroviral therapy. And the study is enrolled to date about 600 uh, or so patients. And what's very important is, as part of the study, we are storing samples, blood samples and urine samples, so we can actually look at biomarkers as well after the end of the study, which I think would be very informative. 
So in conclusion, a substantial and likely increasing proportion of persons living with HIV, enrolled in HIV care and initiating ART will be older in age. And we really need to um, enhance our efforts uh, to diagnose HIV much earlier in older individuals, engage them in programs that address their unique needs and uh, as in terms of both the unique needs relevant to HIV as well as the unique needs relevant to other comorbid conditions. And lastly, I think research is urgently needed to characterize older persons living with HIV and to identify effective models of care for such individuals and to be very pragmatic in terms of trying to answer the questions uh, within the context of ongoing uh, cohorts, for example, optimal uh, model study that I mentioned, or in the context of some of the efforts that uh, conduct, uh, being planned now to conduct population, uh, population level surveys to look at HIV uh, incidence and prevalence at population level. So I want to end by acknowledging some of my colleagues who've been very interested in this area, Matt Lamb, Edward, Edward Eduardo, uh, Chloe Teasdale, and Miriam Rapkin, patients and staff at the health facilities, obviously the ministries of health and partner organizations, and lastly to acknowledge funding from PEPFAR, NIH, and Medtronic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wafa.